All right, this presentation now is the final presentation of the Sign Writing Symposium 2014. I left mine for last. It's number 40, so if you want to see my presentation page, it's presentation 40. And on the presentation page, which you can look later, I don't think it's necessary to have a visual through this right now. We have all been so busy with visuals, and perhaps it's better to have Adam simply interpret for me so that um, at least uh, everybody can understand a little bit about the background behind sign writing. Um, the presentation page 40 is not complete, just as nobody's really ever will be, because there's always more to say, isn't there? about anybody's life or anybody's work. And sign writing is my life's work, which is the reason why it means so much to me to have my presentation 40 page really finished. <laughs> so I just want you to know there's an abstract up there that you may read later. And essentially, I'm, I'm just going to verbalize basically what I said in that abstract. The general paper, which I do plan to write, which will be long and I'm going to post later, and also, I hope to do a PowerPoint someday as well that will mirror what I say in the paper. I'm planning to talk about the history of sign writing and how the script evolved. So it isn't just the history of I went here and then I did that. It's more than that, although that is a part of the history of sign writing too. The real amazing history that has never really been documented on my end is how and why we change certain symbols and then why those symbols evolved into something else. And sometimes when we've been on the sign writing list, which is such a meaningful group of people, I have found that I had trouble explaining why a certain symbol was the way it was. Because there was a history, and I realized, well, that happened. Well, then that symbol changed over here. How come we did that? And we had been using sign writing in a stable way for so many years, that when I look back, when I really look back 40 years ago, the difference is so enormous that it really makes you wonder, how did it evolve where it is today? Well, first of all, it wasn't done alone. This did start out to be my writing system, but it certainly isn't now. Now it's everybody's writing system, and truly, if you think I have any control over it, I do not, and I don't want any. I want to make that really, really clear. Someone said to me the other day, well, how come they were allowed to do that? And I thought to myself, well, first of all, how would I control them not to do that? And second of all, why would I want to? I want everyone to write exactly as they see fit, because what I have learned is that people really do want to communicate, and so they're not going to hurt the system on purpose. They instead try to make it work so people can understand them. And sometimes they just happen across something that really works well, and everybody says, yes, we understand that, and all of us move in that direction. It's just like the natural evolution of any other writing system that's used by tens of thousands of people. So sign writing was originally my invention, but it didn't just start there. I was born in New York City and moved to California when I was eight. And around age 10, I decided with my mother and father to try to become a professional ballet dancer. I got excited about ballet. I loved it. There was no deafness in our family. It had nothing to do with that. I knew nothing about sign language, although as all people who love to dance, I think all dancers are very attracted to sign language since it's very beautiful. <laughs> but uh, that was about it. And I did go into training where I tried to dance five hours a day, and I was wanted to be a professional ballet dancer, but there was something else inside me. It's hard to explain this. I only know that I needed something a little more intellectual as well. Not that dancers aren't brilliant. They are. Please know that. It's just simply that I personally wanted something to study. <laughs> and I was in the dressing rooms of a, of a studio, and there was a book sitting on a couch, and it had different notation systems and history of dance and other things in this great big book as well. And I was leafing through it, and there was a system called Friedrich Albert Zorn's Stick Figure Dance Notation System. Now, Friedrich Albert Zorn, it's spelled Z-O-R-N, 
was back in the 1800s. And his stick figure dance notation system wasn't something totally new. Stick figures have been around since the beginning of time. We all know that. Everybody uses stick figures. Anybody does. Even uh, a new child in the world would use a stick figure when they want to. So it's natural to the human brain, I think, to, to write lines for people and show them on caveman walls, right? But then over time in the dance world, um, there were um, notation systems over time. And one of them uh, was Friedrich Albert Zorn's. And it just happens that his writing system is really cute. <laughs> he placed the stick figure drawings on a five-line staff. He even gave the girls little skirts sometimes. And he showed men and women dancing together on the five-line staff. And he even showed intertwining of five-line staffs under musical notes. And he had pattern stages. And if you look at my dance writing later, you, you can see the influence is quite direct because I had pattern stages, too, in sudden dance writing later. I also want you to understand that I did not study Friedrich Albert Zorn's system. It isn't like that at all. I just got inspired by looking at it. Ah, oh, wow, I can do that, I said to myself. And I started writing down the dances that I was learning in the rehearsals I was in. And I slowly started having stick figure notation scores, just for me. I was age 15 and 16. I didn't think of it to be ever used for anybody else. And as it turned out, I did end up doing some choreography for a school uh, play that had some dances. I was invited back to my eighth grade teacher's classes after I was in high school. And I did some... Uh, choreography for this school play, and I wrote it in my stick figure notation system. That was my first real document. And then time went by, and I decided at age 19 to go to Denmark. And I am not Danish. I have no Danish in my background, but my parents were wonderful and gave me the chance to go to Copenhagen, Denmark in the summer of 1970. I was 19 years old. I studied there with a teacher of the Kirov Ballet Company, which is a Russian ballet company that's world famous. Her name was Nina Velikova. She was one of the great teachers of the Kirov Ballet. It was a chance of a lifetime. And so at age 19, I went to this Copenhagen workshop where Nina Velikova was teaching. And of course, I enjoyed the workshop very much. But while I was there, there were also classes teaching August Born and Veal's dance system that is the Royal Danish Ballet's system of training. And the Royal Danish Ballet, of course, I was in Denmark. So I took those classes too. I found out that August Born and Veal was the director of the Royal Danish Ballet in 1832, and that he had beautiful choreography and a style of ballet training that should be preserved. And when I found out that at that time, no one at the Royal Danish Ballet had written those dances down, and they were being passed along generation by generation by example. And of course, they must have been changing to a certain extent every generation just by the game of telephone, you know, the idea that uh, things do change if you don't record them. I uh, contacted a very wonderful woman named Edel Peterson, who was the expert at the Royal Danish Ballet before she retired. She was elderly at the time. And I asked her if she would let me preserve her memory of what they called the Born and Real Schools. And so every day for two years, I visited Edel Peterson's home, had breakfast on her dining room table, in a place called Charlottenlund, which is outside of Copenhagen. And she would dance with the fingers, because she was older and she couldn't dance anymore, although she was still pretty good, actually. <laughs> and I sat with my pieces of paper, and I wrote what she did. And over time, I realized that my stick figure notation system, which had truly changed greatly since the Friedrich Albert Zorn inspiration, was pretty uh, detailed, and it did better than the word description that some dancers used. So I ended up wanting to preserve the Royal Danish Ballet system of training in Sutton dance writing. I returned to the United States in 19, at the end of 1972, and for one year, which is California, for one year I wrote this book, 
HC. And at the end of 1973, in December, this book was published. It's called Sutton Movement Shorthand. And then, of course, the joke is Book One, The Classical Ballet Key. And the reason why that's funny is that from that time on, I had a book one, a book two, a book three, a book four. I always have book ones, book twos, book threes, book fours. I even had them as a child when I was putting books together, which seems to be my thing. So to make a long story short, I took my stick figure notation system, developed it through writing the, the Bournemouth schools from the Royal Danish Ballet System of Training, and got the courage to write up my writing system. Now, the one thing about this is that we officially announced it in February 1974. Listen to the date. That is exactly 40 years ago, everybody. And sign writing, because sign writing came in six months, sign writing and dance writing and sub movement writing is 40 years old this year, 2014. I'm older than I look, and that's okay by me because I am very, very inspired by all of the presentations here at the Sign Writing Symposium. It's like a great big celebration of our 40 years. This book, notice, is called Sutton Movement Shorthand, but we found out very quickly that really it was not a shorthand. It was a writing system, and that we also could develop a shorthand. So later on, we called it Sutton Movement Writing and Shorthand. And that became the name of my invention. It started out with what we call Sutton Dance Writing, which is what this book is. And then later it became, there was another section for Sutton Sign Writing, another section for Classic Pantomime Writing, which we called Mime Writing. And we also had Sports Writing. We've even written Skateboarding. We've written Ice Skating. We've written up. Gymnastics, lots of stuff. And then the gesture writing analysis area, which is kind of for scientific studies, is what I call movement writing. In 1974, I sent the book to the Queen of Denmark because um, the Queen of Denmark was a student of ballet of my teacher, Edel Peterson. Isn't that fun? My teacher was her teacher. And so I sent a note to the Queen of Denmark and gave her this book and said, because of Denmark, the beautiful country that I lived in for two years, we now have a writing system. And I want you to know that I am preserving the Royal Danish Ballet system of training in this system. And I got a lovely letter back from her secretary thanking us for the book. And about three weeks later, I get a letter from the Royal Theater, the Royal Danish Ballet's director of the Royal Theater, Fleming Flint, saying, here, Miss Sutton, we have a copy of your book on our desk, and we would like to invite you to come back to Denmark to please teach our company, the Royal Danish Ballet, how to read and write dance. So I was invited back to Denmark, and I realized that I could come early, and I got another invitation to teach dance writing at another ballet company called the Tivoli Ballet at Tivoli Gardens. It was directed by um, Niels Bjorn Larsen, and um, it, it is located in the Pantomime Theater. For those of you who, who are familiar with Denmark, you um, enter the, the Tivoli Gardens, and right to the left is this very historic stage. Open seats outside, and a beautiful stage. And the stage is raked. It's on a slant. And it's a historic stage where mime artists would pantomime. That's why it's called the Pantomime Theater. And they had a ballet company. And the ballet company wanted to learn dance writing as well. So I went early uh, because I didn't teach the Royal Danish Ballet until the fall. The summer of 1974 really is the beginning of the true Sutton Movement writing system. Because when I arrived, um, I went to the Tivoli Gardens and started teaching the company. We had to sit on the rake stage because, uh, you know, there was nobody performing at the time and um, all the dancers had no other place to sit. So we all took our ballet clothes and put on a jacket and sat down on this rake stage that was open to the air. And everybody got all of their books out 
and we had a pad of paper out and we were writing dance, I suddenly realized that this rape stage, what is that all about? A rape stage is a slanted stage that historically takes care of depth. In the old days, they didn't have audiences that were slanted up so they could see everything. They just had a flat audience. So how could they see people on the stage that were behind each other? They slanted the stage itself so that the poor performers had to literally stand at a slope so that they could be seen in the back. <laughs> That's a rake stage. One of the dancers said to me, hmm, how are we going to write depth? How are we going to write one foot behind the other? I said, why don't we write it on a rake stage? And from that day on, <laughs> I can give it to the Tivoli Gardens. That was why we have certain depth written the way it is, especially in dance writing. We make a leg shorter if it's behind you. It's a long story. This is not dance writing class, but I'm just trying to tell you that that was the beginning of depth in dance writing. During this time, there was a performer of mine, pantomime, at the pantomime theater. Makes sense, right? But guess what? He was an American. So, of course, I got to know him. His name is Robin Merman. Robin is actually a very famous mime artist. And Robin was trained by a Chen de Cru, a mime artist from Paris. In other words, a Chen de Cru is probably considered, the, at the time anyway, the world's greatest classic pantomime teacher. A Chen de Cru was the teacher of the famous Marcel Marceau. So to study with H.M. de Cru was an honor. And Robin Merman was his student. At least that's my memory of it. <laughs> and so I said to Robin, you know, I would like to write the movements of classic pantomime. And he and I started working together. He even invited me to go over to the Circus de Venevice, the circus over across the street. And I watched him be a clown in the circus. It was wonderful. He's terrific. And he's now living in Maine, which is, is a state in the United States. I, I need to, to contact Robin. But we started writing classic pantomime, and that became Sutton Mime Writing. And mime writing is a little bit more than just uh, acting, believe me. And it's not the gestures that we talk about in the sign language linguistic professions, not at all. Classic pantomime is very, very orderly, and they take their rib cage and they move it over in chunks. Now, I can't do these things, but I can write them <laughs> because we really did write classic pantomime. We had thick pages. And later on, when I was a faculty member of the Boston Conservatory of Music in Boston in the dance department, one of my dance writing uh, students actually traveled to Paris and studied with a Chen de Cru and came back with a huge notebook of written pantomime. So I have to go out in my garage and find all those papers. <laughs> Don't tell me. I know. I ought to keep it more organized. But I want to find them and get them up online because it's about time that the classic pantomime of our writing mime writing comes back. So when you look at those documents, you will notice why we have tilts, you know, and those little polywogs that that you know go forward and go back, and we can do just the upper body. That's the rib cage going over here or over there. Because if you ever looked at Marcel Marceau when he was creating a wall, he could put himself over like this, you know, and in a way that I'm not trained to do. But our writing system could do it because of the summer of 1974. And then, what else happened in 1974? A lot. Niels Bjorn Larsen had a friend. Uh, well, actually, he had many friends. I, I met a whole bunch of important people related to sign writing. But the first thing that happened was I met his son-in-law, actually, Rolf Kuchel. Rolf Kuchel is a linguist in the sign language profession. And Rolf actually studied the movements of a deaf person on a South Pacific island. And this research project was done back in the 70s. This is 1974 we're talking about. Um, and sign language research was pretty new at that time. But uh, Ralph Kuchel went to a South Pacific island and there was a deaf person who was the only one on the whole island because apparently deaf people weren't really allowed to live unless, uh, as babies I mean, unless they were the son of the chief, the chief of the island this boy was. <laughs> 
And it was a very unique uh, sign language, and he asked me to write it. Now, this did come out several years later, but we did do a little booklet together on writing the movements of a sign language in a South Pacific island, in which um, this particular deaf person had nobody else to talk to who was deaf on the whole island, so he was pretty isolated. He had full body signs, and so I was actually using some of dance writing to show these because it was also the lower body, he'd squat when he wanted to show things, etc. Um, then I heard uh, that I was time for me to work with the Royal Danish Ballet, and I went to Fleming Flint, the director of the Royal Danish Ballet, and we arranged that I would teach every morning to the very exhausted dancers. Of all things, they would dance until late in the evening in performances. And then at early in the morning, like at 8 in the morning, they would have dance notation class with Valerie Sutton, which seemed cruel to me as well. But nonetheless, I was honored that they did this. And I had, oh, about 18 beautiful dancers learn how to write dance. And through that process, this book became out of date. Now, I know that sounds a little crazy, but within six months, I realized it could improve. Just that evolution <laughs> is a story in its own right, but of course we can't talk about that right now. But it gives you a perspective on what happened. They did write with it, and they did write dance. They wrote Born in Real Steps. They were good at it. There were volumes of documents that these dancers created, but it wasn't necessarily following everything in this book. It got simpler. It got more visual. Um, such is the way of writing systems. So, while I was at the Royal Danish Ballet, I got a call from, um, of all things, the University of Copenhagen, from a sign language researcher named Lars van der Liet. And Lars said, want to come over to our, our, um, our research lab, the Audio Logo Petis Forstlingsgruppe, over at the University of Copenhagen, and please show us your system for dance writing because we're interested. So I came over there wondering what these researchers would want, and I found that they were interested in writing a video of hearing people sitting on a couch, moving and talking to each other, but you know the movements that hearing people make like I'm doing right now. And also there in this video were deaf people signing to each other in Danish Sign Language, and I was to analyze the difference between their movements using my writing system. Now this really became more like gesture analysis of the hearing people and when I looked at the deaf people, you don't have to tell me, it's obvious, it's a beautiful language, sign languages are, and this was no exception. And although nobody had even told me sign languages were languages, of course I knew that because I love language and I could see it. They were really communicating about something, it was much more than just dancing, which is beautiful too, don't misunderstand me, and is a language too in its own right in a little way, but the word language applied to dance is not the same as the word language applied to sign language, we all know that. So I, I went to Lars and the research group and said, I'm honored to work on this, and yes, of course I'll do this, but I want to ask you something. Danish sign language looks really beautiful, and it looks like a real language, and they said, oh yes, and they educated me about the issues of deafness and everything. And they told me that they had been influenced by Dr. Stokey's work from the United States, that he had proven that sign languages were real languages, and so they wanted to do the same in Denmark. But that wasn't why they were hiring me, and it had nothing, they had no idea about writing sign language. That is not what they hired me for. They wanted me to do this analysis of hearing person's gestures versus the sign language gestures of deaf people because it was for one particular dissertation and um, I believe by Jan Engor, that ended up being published in 1978, I believe, and it was, I was doing the diagrams for his dissertation, and so that was an honor, and I did do that, but I kept bringing up the subject to them, and I said, you know, I really would like to meet some deaf people, and uh, what do you think, maybe they would enjoy writing their language, a totally separate issue, but wouldn't it be kind of fun to try to see what they would think? And um, Lars and, and everybody, it's not that they weren't uh, open-minded people, they were, but they said, why would they want to do that? And I said, well, I don't know, uh, I'm learning Danish right now, and I love that, and, and I have a writing system for learning Danish, it's, 
obviously a Roman alphabet, but I, I'm learning it, and uh, I'm enjoying learning that. But if I didn't have it written, believe me, I couldn't memorize a word. So um, how would um, a foreigner like me learn Danish Sign Language if I don't have a way to write it down? So they said, well, um, why don't you go to a deaf club with us, Valerie? So I actually went to a deaf club in Denmark. I got a kick out of this, and I loved it. And I talked to a bunch of Danish deaf people, and they all looked at me and said, well, yeah, that would be a good idea. Nobody was against it. Absolutely not. But nobody felt the energy to do it either. It was kind of like, it's a nice idea, but hey, little girl, you know, forget it. So I realized that that was not the issue at hand. And I completed my work at the University of Copenhagen over um, a series of years, actually, 1974 and 1975. But that was the beginning of sign writing, no matter what it was. And how did I write the Danish Sign Language within that research? I wasn't yet acclimated to what we would do today, obviously. So I just took dance writing, which is what we had at the moment, and I just wrote the upper body. And we wrote it from left to right. And instead of being on a five-line staff like dance writing, I did put it on three lines to keep us writing in a line. Later, that was dropped. And pretty much later, a lot of other things were dropped. So because of time, I would like to show you what ended up happening in the dance world. In the dance world, this is Stanley, the stick figure. Yeah, we gave him a name. <laughs> and can you see, this is his, if you can see it, those are his hips. And up here are his shoulders. Can you see it? And we also have arms and legs and feet <laughs> and we have a neckline that line we call a face direction line still used in some areas of our system this general stick figure notation system turned into a real world used dance notation system um, after um, 1976 I became a full-time faculty member in the dance department of the Boston Conservatory of Music's dance department. And dance, Sutton Dance Writing was a requirement for graduation of all dance majors from 1976 to 1986. And during that time, um, we qualified teachers, and we had, I think, around 80 qualified teachers of Sutton Dance Writing. Um, in the meantime, before that happened, I brought it back home from Denmark between 1974 and 1976, and that's where I met Nancy Romero. In 1975, Nancy and I uh, met, and we um, started working together. Nancy started writing dance with me. Um, I came out with a uh, notation supplement to improve this book. The changes just kept happening just by using the system. But I also said, hey, Nancy, you know what? I wrote sign language when I was in Denmark. And um, you know what? I like it. And I think we should do something. And I'd like to call it sign writing. And so I contacted people in my own country and said, you know, we could write sign language. Why do I try? And everybody kind of thought I was nuts, I think. And in fact, a lot of people were against it. And we had a lot of controversy. Um, and I also had to learn who to contact and who not to. I had to learn about language and what was real language and what isn't. To make a very long story short, sign writing evolved in Denmark, mind you. We ended up coming back to Denmark in 1982 after Nancy started publishing the sign writer newspaper in the United States. And in 1982, I taught the Danes to read and write sign writing. They, in the school system there, adopted sign writing under Britta Hansen at the um, Communication Center in Copenhagen at School. They have a research area there for COPSI, as they call it, the Communication Center. And um, this is, for example, Anna Greta Pedersen. This is a deaf woman in Denmark around 1982. Britta Hansen was uh, the leader of this research group, and she had received the sign writer newspaper in the mail that Nancy Romero had founded and started. And we sent it out to everybody, and then we get this letter from Britta Hansen in Denmark saying, hey, we want to try to use this because we would like to have 
real bilingual education where sign language and spoken language are equal. And that they did in Denmark with a research project. They got funding from 1982 to 1988. And this is how they wrote and how we were writing at the time in the United States as well. Can you see? There were stick figures. Whoa. <laughs> stick figures. It was written receptively. Stanley the stick figure now just had shoulders. And he was facing you. And he did have that little face direction line. And but the movement arrows are almost exactly the same as they are today. That I really take pride in, that the movement symbols have basically stayed the same except for minor changes. And later on in my paper, I'm going to document how this symbol changed. I'm going to literally give a history. And why did this symbol change? But the, one of the coolest things that happened to me last night when I took this Danish book out, I looked and I found heel of hand. There is a hand shape that I happen to love. And it is a hand shape that was used in 1982. And I got proof of it because here it is. There is heel of hand. <laughs> and it represented a hand shape like this that you sort of see the you sort of see the wrist, if you're seeing it from the expressive point of view, although this was receptive, but we were using heel of hand from that as well. What happened was, the system changed a lot in the hand shapes. At the time of 1982, when we were teaching deaf children in Denmark, and it became the part of the school system in Denmark, um, this, the sign writing system was receptive, it used a stick figure, and the hand shape palm facing system was totally different. At the time, we didn't have the dark and light like we have now. Dark and light had a different meaning. I know, it's a surprise, right? Because we did change over, pretty big change. Um, it was uh, right after I left Denmark. Um, let's see. It must. I'm not quite sure exactly when you see I want to look this up. But um, I, I gave a call to a linguist in Denmark from the United States, and I said, I've decided to um, change the palm facing system to dark and light and this just as we had now. And when that change occurred, it was a big change but a necessary one. It helped enormously. All of a sudden we had a standard way of doing palm facing. Another big change that occurred was um, when we did the sign writer newspaper with Nancy Romero, as I mentioned. It was 20 pages written by hand for four years and um, there was a staff of deaf people involved as well. One of them was Lucinda O'Grady Batch, who is now named Lucinda O'Grady Farnady. And Lucinda and another deaf staff member, Miriam Anna Schroeder, both requested that we start writing in the expressive, that we change from receptive to expressive, that we change from writing from left to right to writing down in vertical columns, and that we throw out the full stick figure and only write in a stacked way the way that we do today, except it was a little bit different. It sort of evolved slowly but surely into the way we stack today. But I can give, I mean, we have a video on my presentation 40 page that is an old video called Deaf Perspectives on Sign Writing, the history of how sign writing changed. It only goes to about 1998, but in that video, Lucinda is so expressive in telling the story about how she felt after writing articles of a newspaper, looking at somebody signing, she wanted to write it from her own expressive point of view. And so therefore we did become expressive. Now we had all kinds of arguments against it, but it really works. And I don't think anybody wants to change back now. Even if there were some benefits to the receptive, there certainly um, the benefits to the expressive is enormous because it's turned it into from a transcription system of what somebody else is doing into a real writing system from your heart. The way you feel it, the way you express it, it's your writing system. And that's why sign writing is spreading because people like Lucinda and Nancy and Adam and all of you on the sign and writing list and all of you who've done your presentations have written your hearts out and you've written so much 
that the sign writing system is just spreading. Isn't it a miracle that there were 40 presentations for 40 years? Well, this is our birthday, everybody. I can't believe it. And I want to thank you for giving me the gift of presenting in this symposium because I cannot think of a better gift for the birthday of the system. And now we have the future. What are we going to do in the next decade? There are a lot of evolutionary changes in the future, I'm sure, but generally we're pretty standardized in many ways, and there are more and more people working together to make sure that we can read each other's documents. So I do believe that we are on the way of truly having a written form for all sign languages in the world, and you all have been a part of it.